Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. As always, make sure to subscribe wherever you hear this, be it YouTube, Transistor, Anchor, Apple, Google, or Spotify. You can share the very words that you hear read aloud and recited by me, or you can share a link to wherever you found this with your friends, strangers, and especially with your enemies, or at least those whom you think are your enemies. And finally, you can support at aksum.substack.com, that's A-K-S-U-M dot substack.com, or at patreon.com slash tawahado, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. Without further ado, today we'll be reading from the King James Version, Revelation chapter 10, or the scroll of the apocalypse, the scroll of the uncovering. Let's begin with verses 1 to 4. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little scroll open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Very interesting, but not that mysterious. There's a rainbow here. The rainbow, remember, it's not a symbol of your giggling and joy, and it's not uh, part of someone's political agenda. And what it is not is it's not something that shoots out of the bellies of Care Bears. No. The rainbow is from the Noahic covenant, the covenant of our father Noah, who survived the great. Uh, flood. And so the bow in Hebrew, Kashti, as in the bow and arrow, is related etymologically to the rainbow. And so when we think of the Kashti, which is the rainbow, and the Kashti, which is the bow and arrow, we have to remember the judgment of God. And what we can say about the sort of mysteriousness of it being kept secret here for a little bit in chapter 10 is that Judgment Day has not yet arrived. But it is ominous to hear about Judgment Day because that means we need to ready ourselves. We need to prepare ourselves for judgment. Verses 5 to 7. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants, or his slaves, the prophets. This is reminiscent of Psalm 24 in the Masoretic or Western tradition and Psalm 23 in the Old Greek or the Eastern tradition. And in it, we hear that the earth is the Lord's, the earth is Yahweh's and the fullness thereof. Yahweh or the Lord Adonai is the Melech Olam. He is the king of the world, the king of the universe, the king of the the cosmos and a king in the Semitic context is to say the chief capitalist, the owner, the proprietor, he who has dominion of everything that is. And that king, that owner, that proprietor, that being with dominion over all that there is in the heavens and the earth, and even for hyperbole purposes, the sea, which, as you could recall, in the Noah Covenant, uh, they didn't need any protection, the creatures of the deep, because uh, they know how to live in water. But here they're added. It's just interesting because you have the, the Kashti reference to the Noah Covenant earlier. 
And so we are invited as hearers to read and reread, to hear and rehear the story of the prophets, whether they're called prior prophets, major prophets, or minor prophets. Here, there's no distinction. It just says the prophets. So go and reread all of the prophets. Verses 8 to the end. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little scroll which is open in the hand of the messenger which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the messenger and said unto him, Give me the little scroll. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll out of the messenger's hand and ate it up and it was in my mouth sweet as honey and as soon as i had eaten it my belly was bitter and he said unto me thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings if you hear chapter 10 of revelation and don't remember ezekiel I am going to start to believe that you've never read Ezekiel. Ezekiel does a lot of things which seem just bat crazy to us when we hear about them. He rolls around on the floor and faces different directions for 90 days. But of all the things that he does that are craziest is that he consumes the scroll of the instruction of Yahweh, of the Lord. And so here we see this repetition where we see John acting as a new Ezekiel. We could call him Ezekiel Jr. or Ezekiel II. And he takes this scroll of the instruction of God given to him by the angel or by the messenger. And just like a lot of us, when we, when we hear God's word for the first time, we think it's sweet. We think it's, it's beautiful. We think it's pleasant. It sounds nice. But as soon as we have to swallow and digest it, we realize how bitter it is because it is simple when we hear it, but it is hard and difficult for us to do, to practically live out on a daily basis, wherever we are, in our workplaces or in our homes or at school, wherever we are, trying to fulfill the written law and instruction of the Lord is very difficult. And as Ezekiel expresses the universality of God here in chapter 10 of Revelation, we see the all-encompassingness, the universality of God in that he is telling his new prophet connected to the prophets from before that we are told to uh, reread so that we can understand what has been declared to them and that they then spoke to the people. So this new prophet, this new Ezekiel, John, is not just a member of a tiny sect. He's not just a member of one little city-state with one little statuesque deity. No, instead he is a slave of the Most High God, the King of the universe, to whom be glory forever and ever.